Morning, everyone. Afternoon, everyone. I want to start with a quick warning here because hackers are everywhere. And you know who I'm talking about. It's people like this. <laughs> the, the businessman, the guy in the suit, hacking into people's accounts, hacking into user accounts everywhere. It's people like this lady who apparently is able to get hold of a laptop, even in jail, in order to hack into people. And people like this guy who is so apparently into it that he needs to wear sunglasses whilst in a darkened room. But whatever he is doing is working because there is money pouring out of this keyboard. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Phil Nash, uh, and I'm a developer evangelist for a company called Twilio. Uh, Twilio is a communications platform uh, for your applications uh, to uh, communicate with your users via voice, video, or messaging uh, in the tools, languages, and frameworks that you already know. Uh, but we're not here to talk about uh, that kind of thing. It might pop up because it's kind of useful in, under this topic. What we are here to talk about is uh, 2FA, or two-factor authentication. I like to uh, start this, because I've gone with the snappy uh, and yet possibly naughty title, uh, with an actual explanation of what two-factor authentication is. Uh, and so I'm just going to read this one quickly. Because two-factor authentication is a security process in which a user provides two different forms of identification in order to authenticate themselves with a system. And those two forms must come from different categories, normally something you know and something you have. A third potential category is some kind of biometrics, something you are. Uh, but uh, I've, uh, I kind of learned some interesting things about that recently. And you, know, you might think fingerprints are pretty secure. Uh, but um, I, I think a country, somewhere, uh, somewhere in the world, a country lost 11 million uh, records of, of they, their um, nationals' uh, fingerprint data. Uh, so that's kind of uh, a bit screwed for them. Uh, especially because you can't really revoke these little passwords. Um, so two-factor authentication at the moment uh, tends to be you know, something you know, a password, and, and something you have. Um, a, a good example of that is, uh, is your bank card, which, in which you have a card, and you probably have a PIN number on there. And in order to get money out uh, of your account, uh, you need to both insert the card and provide the PIN number. So two-factor authentication has been around for, for quite a while in that respect. Uh, but we're talking about building into applications now. So I want to start with, uh, go into with like, kind of why, why we'd want to include two-factor authentication. Uh, and I want to start with a, a little story of a, a kind of nasty hack that happened. Um, you might have heard of this one, but I'm going to run through kind of the interesting details of this. Uh, this guy is called Matt Honan, uh, and he is a journalist. And um, back in 2012, uh, he kind of had his digital life destroyed uh, by some not particularly nice people. And uh, they did it. Uh, they, you know, they got into his accounts in no kind of technical way, uh, very, very few technical details, just uh, by knowing their way around various systems. And so I have kind of a timeline of, of how this happened and how he got hacked and everything got destroyed, uh, which you might find interesting. They found uh, his Gmail address on his website. Perfectly reasonable uh, thing to do, I suppose. Uh, and they uh, uh, entered that address into Gmail and found that he had a me.com email as a backup email. So if he got locked out of that, the password would get emailed off to that other uh, email account. All's fine. So the hackers called Amazon up. And they said, hi, I'm Matt Honan. I'd like to add a credit card to my file. Uh, and Amazon went, you're probably going to have to prove you're Matt Honan. That's, that's probably a good idea. Uh, and uh, and they, they, they couldn't with the normal kind of security questions because they didn't know the answers to those. But, you know, after persistence, uh, the Amazon employee eventually said, okay, all we need in order to add this credit card to your account, all we need is your email address and your billing address. And so they had the email address from the website and they got hold of that billing address uh, through about the most technical part of this hack, uh, which is like a who is lookup on the domain name. Perfectly reasonable, it's fairly easy to do. Uh, and so they gave him that account, load those details, and added a credit card to his account. That sounds like they're doing him a favor at the moment, uh, but that's not what it's all for. Because then they called back and wanted to get their password reset, in fact, the email address reset, because they lost access to his original email. Uh, so they wanted to get this reset. And of course, the same security questions come up, and the same things are bypassed, because they don't know. And eventually, the Amazon support staff said, we need an uh, email address, a billing address, and the last four digits of a credit card that's on file. So they weren't being nice by giving him extra money to spend. They just had that credit card on file and were then able to reset his email and get uh, a password to the Amazon account sent to their email address. Cool. 
So then they called up Apple. And this is about the time that uh, um, like he, he, went, he went investigating this as a journalist to find out actually what happened. And so this is a timeline that came from Apple support uh, to say that they called it 4.33 p.m. And, uh, and they said, all right, we need to, you know, I need to reset my me.com email address uh, password. I need to get that sent somewhere because I can't get in. And of course, the same process happened as with Amazon. You know, no, no, no questions, no passwords could be, be told, but they just needed a billing address, an email address, and the last four digits of a credit card on file. Of course, because they had access to his Amazon account, Amazon shows you the last four d digits of any, email, of any credit card that's on their files. So they used that. Cool. So at 4.50 PM, they eventually got that Apple ID password reset and gained access to his me.com email address. And this is where things started to move fairly quickly, because then they reset his Gmail account password uh, at 4.52. And then you know, nine minutes later, wiped his iPhone just for fun. Uh, at 5.02, they reset his Twitter password. That was also for fun. Uh, 5.05, they wiped his MacBook, deleted his Google account. He was probably noticed something at this point. Probably something was going wrong. Um, because everything was dark and you couldn't turn anything on. Uh, and then 5.12 p.m., uh, the attackers actually posted to Twitter uh, to take credit to the hack, for the hack. Uh, oddly enough, kind of between 5.02 and resetting the Twitter password and 5.12, uh, whilst destroying other things, they also posted racist and homophobic slurs on, on his Twitter account and then admitted to it. I don't quite understand that, but they did. Uh, and this was the only reason why they did this, of course, was because they wanted... They wanted his Twitter account. They, Matt Honan uh, signed up to Twitter very early on and had the uh, username Matt. And these hackers didn't even really want anything to do with it. They just wanted to mess with him. And that, that they did. But the fact of the matter is that in all of those situations, uh, at Amazon, Apple, me.com, Gmail, Twitter, if there'd been a requirement for a second factor of authentication in order to access the account, none of that would have happened. Or only to that point could that have happened. Uh, and that would have saved uh, him losing a bunch of photos that he hadn't backed up of his daughter, as well as all this access and all this other stuff which, he'd have to, uh, which he had to recover. Horrible. Another reason why we might want to be interested in two-factor authentication uh, comes to just the, uh, the, the humble password itself. Now, uh, you know, we're developers in this room, and we're probably doing something like using uh, one password or last pass in order to, um, in order to keep our, our passwords both secure and different in every account. Great idea. Uh, I'll admit, I'm not using this, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, but uh, if you're doing that, that's cool, that's great. You're relatively safe, uh, you know, but many users aren't doing that kind of thing. I want to talk about a different hack. Uh, middle of last year, or no, kind of autumn last year, Ashley Madison, the, um, the, uh, this uh, dating site, I want to call it. I can't think of any better way to put it. You know what it does. Um, <laughs> Ashley Madison was hacked, right? And, and the attackers eventually released all the data that they got out of Ashley Madison. Uh, that data uh, included about, um, oh, that included all account data. And a security firm was, uh, was actually able to take that and break 11 million of the passwords. Ashley Madison were hashing their passwords, but this block of 11 million uh, was not hashed strong enough and was thus broken. Uh, and so they were uh, released out onto the internet as well. Uh, and now, uh, you know, if you're interested in this, uh, we have the top 10 passwords of those 11 million users from Ashley Madison. <laughs> Any guesses for uh, what comes in at number one? What's the top password? It's one, two, three, four, five, six. We got there in the end. That's cool. Uh, what I really like is number two, which is just ever so slightly lazier. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's right, that's right. Password was in at number three. Secret, I don't think's in there, actually. I don't know. That's, that's a quite a good one. Um, any other call? I think we got, yeah, one, two, three, four. No, default. I don't, in all caps, I don't quite get that one. Never, never thought about it. Um, one, two, three, five, six, nine. nine. Uh, it's more secure because it's longer. <sighs> um, QWERTY, that's an easy, that's a good one. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Can't quite get all the way to the end. Uh, ABC one, two, three. Actually, much harder to type. That one's just good to remember, I guess. But um, the number nine was not. <laughs> number nine was not the characters NSFW. But I'm not going to put that up on screen because we have codes of conduct and things like that. <laughs> Uh, and number 10 was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Shocking, right? Uh, but what's more shocking in a way is actually the numbers of people using these passwords. 
Uh, and in at number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, used by 120,511 people. <laughs> if you're using a site for that, which is pretty, you know, it's a pretty secret site. I mean, the person on the front is going, like, keep it quiet, secret. Why are you using this password? <laughs> Um, but, you know, you might also take the idea that maybe all of these passwords were actually created by people making fake accounts to really kind of find out what's going on and then, like, leaving them. They didn't really care. But that's 11 million passwords. There's definitely some real ones in there. And those are connected with an email address and connected and, and a password. And if that person's used that elsewhere, anywhere on the internet, uh, people can attack that. And this is actually where it comes to a bit of a personal story. I've given this talk a few times. However, since the last time I gave it, I lost access to two accounts because they were hacked into. It's kind of embarrassing. <laughs> I believe it actually turns, as I said, I don't use one password, I don't use LastPass, I'm bad with passwords. Uh, and I shouldn't be, I know it, but I haven't fixed it yet. I'm working to fix it because I got hacked. Um, I think what actually happened, I'm not entirely sure of the details, but I believe that when Adobe was actually broken into and leaked a whole bunch of passwords and email addresses, that is where my account details came from. And so uh, over, it was not last weekend, it was the weekend before, I was, on my way, uh, I was on my way out and I got out the tube in London and received a text message saying, here's your Dropbox code, like log into Dropbox. And I was like, I didn't try to log into Dropbox. <laughs> but... I didn't go and log into Dropbox, nobody got that code, nobody broke into my Dropbox account, that was kind of cool. Later on in the day, I lost my Spotify account, which is kind of frustrating. Uh, and, then, uh, and that took a whole day to, with like, going back and forth with the support team, proving I was who I was, even though I definitely got the email saying, your email's been changed from this to that. Anyway. Got that one back, two days later, my Skype account also went, went away. That was quite sad. A friend like, tweeted me and was like, have you been hacked? Because my name was now uh, 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 Elizabeth Dupuy. Uh, and I was, um, it turned out when I got access back to the account, it turned out I'd sent an awful lot of invitations to men to find out if I could marry them. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know why they needed my account to do that. You can just start up a Skype account, it's free. <laughs> but they wanted to apparently do it from the name Phil Nash. Uh, so, <laughs> don't know, don't know. Um, some men seemed into it as well. I didn't really... Anyway, but I got back hold of those accounts. Uh, I've, I've attempted to convince Spotify to add two-factor authentication to their uh, thing. I haven't quite gotten to Skype yet, but I, I want to see more of that because my Dropbox account, as I said, was the first one I found was possibly going wrong, but it was, it was the one that was safe. The password is now changed, but no one got in. Two-factor auth. Cool. So how do we go about doing this? Uh, You might think of a, a, a fairly regular user registration flow is pretty simple. You visit a registration page, pop in an email address and a password, which can be your username, and you're logged in. And then you know you go back. You know the use the site uh, as a, as a good site is using a strong hashing password algorithm and a good salt and things like that in order to make this nice and safe. And then when you sign in, you know you put those details back in. The system verifies those details, and you're signed in. It's pretty straightforward. So how do we put two-factor authentication into this? Well, the first option, uh, and you've probably used it, and this is what I had from Dropbox, uh, is, is SMS. Uh, and this is also, if you uh, want to do this kind of thing with SMS on your own, then Twilio is an excellent example of somewhere you could send SMS from. But uh, what would happen is you need to obviously take the user's phone number, uh, and you can send a, a bit of a... You can send a confirmation at this point. You might be confirming email addresses as well. But the important thing is when the user goes to log in, uh, once you've verified that that username and password is correct, uh, you can generate a code. Um, it, when you're using SMS, uh, it, you can probably do it just by generating a random six-digit code. Or um, Six seems to be the most popular. Uh, you can go for more to make it more safe. Uh, and then save that to your user account uh, somewhere as a, as a sign-in attempt or something like that. Uh, and then send it via SMS, and then wait for them to receive that, enter that code back in, and then you can look that back up against the user account, and uh, in they go. Sounds cool. Um, there's some pros and cons to this. Uh, in the pros, uh, what's brilliant is that so many people in the world have a phone that can receive an SMS. Me uh, an SMS. Uh, text messaging is, is one of the kind of most lo-fi things we do with our devices, and when you've got the smartest device, or the cheapest thing on the market, you can probably receive a text message. 
And so that makes this available to so many people. It's, it's brilliant. Like this level of security can just be added to anybody. On the pros, uh, no, sorry, on the cons uh, side of things, um, yeah, like in order to receive one of these, you have to have signal. Uh, I've been uh, bitten twice by this, as I, uh, I don't have data in this country, so I got a SIM card at the airport, and so I wasn't using my number. And I actually tried to log into my Twilio account, which is kind of a useful thing for me, uh, as you know, I have to work with it. And uh, and I, it was like, we've sent you a text message. I right, now I have to change SIM cards and things like that. It was really kind of annoying. Uh, so I, I could do with a dual SIM iPhone, I think. But uh, you know, sometimes you can't receive those messages. Um, similarly, on the con side, uh, text messaging tends to cost. Um, it's easier if you want to send worldwide text messages. You absolutely want to use a service like Twilio, or there are others. Uh, however, they are going to cost you to do so. So it may be not the most economical, especially if you're just starting up. And text messages are not uh, infallible to being hacked as well. It is entirely possible to put up your own telephone pole, uh, your own telephone signal, and intercept people's text messages. They are sent in the clear, uh, much like an email is. And uh, if you have, if you really want to break into somebody's account which has two-factor authentication by SMS, and you have your own uh, telephone mast, then you, you know you can do it. It seems unlikely, but it's possible. So we think about an alternative. Uh, which is the soft token. And you'll have seen this if you've used uh, any kind of application which generates uh, a code. And, and so if we see uh, on, this, um, on the registration flow, instead of taking a phone number or anything like that, you need to generate a, uh, a secret, longer the better, uh, um, you know, ran a big, long, secure, random set of, uh, uh, of string, and share that secret with the user somehow. Uh, and we'll go uh, into how that works in a minute. And then the user logged in, and when you um, and when the user then goes to log in again, uh, the user will have got that secret into an authentication app. Now Google make one; it used to be open source. The latest version of it isn't, but there is an open source version of it on GitHub still. Um, uh, we also make one at Twilio. I'll tell you a bit about that in a minute as well. But you open that application, you find that user account that you've added into it somewhere in the in the list of accounts. And, uh, and the app like, generates you your six-digit code at that point, and you enter that code into the system, and the system can generate that code as well. Uh, and then if they're the same or close, we'll talk about close as well in a minute, uh, then you're logged in. Um, so talking about secrets and sharing them and things like that, what, we're, what this uh, kind of scheme is called um, is, is one-time passwords. Uh, and there's kind of two var variations of it. The, uh, HOTP, which is the HMAC-based one-time password, and TOTP, which is the time-based one-time password. And they've been around, they're a standard, have been around since about the mid-80s, and uh, this is how it works uh, in kind of sort of maths. Um, if you want to make uh, an HMAC-based one-time password, you need a key, that is the secret that you generate for that user, and a counter. Uh, and you can, like, you can do this counter however you want, but counting up from one is pretty good, or zero if you like to. Uh, and you take, the, um, you take the HMAC digest of the key and the counter, uh, and then you, uh, like, you truncate that, uh, which is a uh, deterministic, uh, the algorithm for the truncation here is a deterministic way of, of picking four bytes out of the middle of that uh, digest. Um, that is then a positive bit mask, so that if you're in a language uh, that has um, signed integers, uh, that will make it positive. Uh, and then to get the final value, your six digits, or however many digits you want, uh, you, you create that and then uh, just take the mod of 10 to the number of digits that you want. So 10 to the six, as I said, is the uh, kind of normal uh, version of that. Uh, and that's it. Um, Fairly straightforward. It's a, you know it's it's been around since the 80s. There are uh, uh, libraries in in languages to do all of this, which is great. Uh, and what I actually uh, kind of recommend uh, is taking a look through uh, this one. This is the uh, Node.js one-time password uh, NOTP, and it's just it's really readable. Uh, like JavaScript is not full of boilerplate and anything like that. If you want to see exactly how this works, you can go and uh, and take a look at the source of that, as I think it's absolutely amazing. And then, uh, so that was the HMAC one. Uh, the time-based one-time password is exactly the same as the HMAC-based one-time password, except the counter uh, is based on time. So what you do is you take a period, it's normally 30 seconds. Uh, you divide uh, the number of seconds since the epoch, since 1970, uh, by that period, 
and, uh, and that kind of keeps incrementing every 30 seconds. Uh, and we can see how this works. I just want to show you quickly how this works. I've got the, uh, you can read that, right? Uh, I've got the, the library right here. So uh, if we just pop into Node, uh, I really uh, like it. So we've got NOTP. Um, and this is great to see kind of how it works as well. So we have these two functions, HOTP and TOTP, which is nice. Uh, and if I just grab the HOTP one, you can see they both have a generate function and a verify function. Uh, and that's all you need to do with these things, which is great. Um, so if we take the secret uh, hello, not particularly secret in this case, uh, but as you already know, I'm not very good with passwords. Um, and you give it a counter, then we get to generate our six-digit code. That's cool. And if you do the same thing again, you're going to get the same code, which is great. Uh, so, and then you can verify that by adding in the code, 147, uh, and the secret, and the counter. Uh, and you get an answer. So if that was wrong in any way, oops. If that was wrong in any way, uh, say I missed off the eight, uh, you get null. Uh, I wish it was false, but null. JavaScript day. It's falsey, so that's good enough. Uh, and of course, like if we change the counter, we also get different. Oops, that's verifying. If we change the counter, we get uh, different numbers. Uh, and there's no seeming pattern between the the numbers that this generates because of the uh, algorithm. You have to know the secret, and you have to put it through the algorithm. Uh, so if we then take TOTP, um, it, it's actually easier to work with, uh, in my opinion, because you don't have to deal with that counter. And so what you have to do with the counter is, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with the counter, you have to like keep it level somehow with the user. So uh, that's why we kind of see this um, delta uh, here. It shows you that like that was correct. It's just not quite. We're not quite matching the counters. So one or the other side has to update uh, their counter to be. Uh, equal to the current one if we if it's within a delta that we trust so you can choose that um, If we then go to TOTP uh, as I say this time you don't even have to add the counter Because it's just going to generate it for you based on the time and as you see it's still the same And then it changed that was the period ticking over and you've seen if you've used one of these applications uh, you've seen that thing count down from zero, uh, from 30 to zero, and you know inevitably you just try to log in, and it's at 27 seconds. You're like rushing to type the thing in. Um, uh, but again, this delta thing actually helps you in this case because um, we can say that we know that the number was 480881, and hello. And we can say, all right, but they were close, right? This, they actually they put it in within a minute, not within 30 seconds, uh, or within a minute and 30 seconds if you're, if you're okay with that. Maybe two minutes is too long, so you make the, that kind of delta as long as it's less than three. Uh, you believe that the user is uh, in a time zone that you trust or something like that. Uh, and so that's kind of how it works, and it's really nice. Uh, and so we could verify our latest one. Uh, let's generate one and then verify the latest one just to see. Eight, seven, eight, three, six. Nope, still not the latest, brilliant. <laughs> My periods are taking over much quicker than I thought they would. Uh, and this library does let you set uh, the different variables as well. So you can choose the length of your period. You can choose the length of the secret that you, uh, not the secret, sorry, the, um, the number of digits that you create. Um, so that's kind of cool. I think it's a, it's a great library. Just go uh, check out the code, because uh, it's very readable and very good for all of this. Cool. So sharing secrets is the second difficult part about this, because you generate uh, a code. Uh, I think in terms, if you use Google Authenticator, Google, when they do this, generates a 12-character uh, code. Uh, it's recommended to actually generate a 16-character uh, code, uh, but long things along. Um, you don't want to be typing uh, these things into, uh, into the app, because typing 12 or 16 digits can be difficult. Uh, so this is where we get the one and only happy time that anyone should ever be using QR codes. Apologies to anybody who made the badges for this conference. Um, and this is how you do it. You generate a URL that you turn into a QR code, and the URL kind of looks a bit like this. We have a, the scheme should be OTP or uh, the type will be the, whether it's HOTP or TOTP. Uh, you give a label, and this is what the user sees in the application, uh, uh, you know, uh, because you can have the same application but different accounts, so that tends to involve the user account you're talking about as well. And then some other parameters, which uh, include uh, the secret itself uh, and the label again as, as an as a issuer. 
And so this is an example. Uh, so you, this is an example of doing it as TOTP. That's a bit small, but that's TOTP there. The label here would be example. This is my example application. And the account then is, is my email address. So I'd be able to differentiate if I had two accounts. Uh, we have the secret and then an issuer again, just to be like, this is just the name of the application. Uh, and so you wrap all that up into a nice QR code, flash it on the screen and get the user to uh, take a picture of it and, uh, and, and get it into their application. Uh, I, as I said, I'm, I love uh, QR codes. I think there's very few uses for them. And this is my favorite Tumblr of all time. Uh, it was started back in 2012 and still has no posts on it. Um, so, but somebody actually scanned my QR code earlier on my badge. So I mean, maybe I'll have to try and send in pictures. But I do think that having this QR code, this ability to share things uh, uh, easier is actually um, is much better. It comes down, in the end, though, to some pros and cons on that as well. Uh, the pros for this kind of thing is it's free to do, obviously. Uh, you don't have to pay for sending a text message. Uh, and um, there are decent libraries out there to, to take you through that process, uh, as we've seen the NOTP library there. Uh, cons, uh, it requires, of course, a smartphone, which uh, maybe all of us in this room have, I don't know, uh, but not everybody in the world has, of course. Uh, you need some device which is able to um, yeah, have an application and keep these things for you. Um, also in terms of uh, cons, those secrets that you keep, that you have to keep in, uh, for the user, uh, you have to, of course, keep in plain text. You can't be um, hashing those. They're not a password. You need to be generating the function from them. So uh, if you are to lose access to your database, um, then all the secrets are lost as well. And uh, as particularly if you use Google Authenticator, you can't then revoke those secrets either. You have to just stop everything. Uh, so so keeping, keeping those secrets secret uh, is, is pretty much the, the, the tough bit there. So can it be better? Uh, that's hopefully a question we're asking. I think it can, and for a few reasons. Um, one, I mean, that's... Uh, uh, we, we, you, building this process is not necessarily straightforward, and as with anything in security, uh, things can go wrong. And so I've been told many times by people that friends don't let friends wipe their own authentication frameworks. And this is why, uh, so I'm a Ruby developer, I'm a JavaScript developer, and, and in, in Ruby and Rails we have Devise, which is a, um, a framework for authentication that uh, people have written and many people have looked at and people have fixed glaring security holes in and now it is fairly safe and people keep looking at it. Uh, in Node.js, I believe there's Passport, which does a very similar thing uh, working on top of Express. Uh, but I, don't, I also think you probably shouldn't write your own two-factor authentication frameworks as well. Uh, and I want to just tell you a little bit about uh, a company um, or a product uh, called Authy. Um, and Authy were a, uh, a company that uh, were bought by Twilio just over a year ago, and they provide uh, two-factor authentication as a service. Effectively, it takes three API calls to do all of the stuff we've kind of talked about already. And so uh, when you do this with Authy, um, you take the username, password, and phone number, and then register that user with Authy. So in this case, the phone number is the second factor, the thing that the user has. Uh, because you can use it on multiple devices, but it has to be authenticated by the phone number. And so your system just registers via one API uh, call uh, to Authy, and you get back just a, an Authy ID, and that's the only thing you have to save. Uh, you don't have to keep hold of any secrets. You don't have to keep hold of their phone number if you don't want to. And then when you log in, uh, instead of like generating your own codes and see, um, uh, to, be, to be added, you just send a, a message off to Authy, and Authy will prompt the user some way. Uh, if, uh, so there is an application for Authy. It works much the same as Google Authenticator. Uh, but uh, if, you, um, if you're using Authy, then uh, the application will get a push notification to say, hey, you're trying to log in somewhere. If the user has not installed the application and logged into it, they'll get a text message. So you don't have to worry about how you're going to send these things out. Uh, and so they get their code either way via the app, via the text message, enter it onto the site. Uh, and then the final API call is uh, that verifying of the code that they entered. And you just send off the user ID and the code they entered, and Authy says if that was OK or not. It's kind of nice. It's kind of really easy. But it gets better, I think, because all of that ends up with users entering six or seven digit codes into a login form and having to copy and paste across from a phone or from a text message. And one of the issues with security that I think as hugely important is user experience. Like people do not want to use uh, systems 
which make it harder for them to use your application. And so, and this is certainly one of them. Like, you can tell there's a trade-off between security and, and experience, but it could be better than this copying across. And so, I said that Authy sends a push notification to say, hey, copy this code. But the kind of latest feature actually allows it to go through a push notification, and then, um, instead of uh, writing or uh, copying across that code, uh, there is a whole, um, you're able to just accept the login, accept the authentication within the application. I actually have a quick video just to show how that works. Um, so we have a fictional bank, the Owl Bank, uh, here. And when you sign in uh, and log in, it's going to say, okay, we want your code. But on the phone, you get that push notification. And uh, when you open that up, it's going to take you straight into that application. And it's going to say, like, the Owl Bank's asking if you want to log in. Is this you? And you can approve or deny that. And when you approve it, it sends a webhook back to the original service uh, and, um, and allows that to then, like a bit of JavaScript or a refresh, move the user on. All you have to do is say, yes, I am logging in, or yes, I am making this transaction right now. Uh, and the application will move you on. I just want to point out, because like, I talk about transactions there as well, this is not just for logging in. Uh, in fact, two-factor authentication itself doesn't have to just be lo for logging in. If you are doing high-value transactions, like uh, sending somebody money or something like that, uh, particularly relevant in this case of this totally fictional bank, um, this kind of screen here can have much more information about it. It can be like, you, you know, you're sending this much money to this person. Is this all OK? Uh, and uh, you know, that, puts, that puts power back into the user's hands to both be more secure and be able to um, accept or, or deny these kind of requests, uh, but without having to mess about getting their phones out to copy things across. And I just think the experience is so much better. Uh, there are, of course, uh, similar pros and cons to this. Uh, again, you still need that. Um, uh, you still need the smartphone, so this is not going to work for people without a smartphone. Um, and it does cost a bit as well. And you have to build a bit more infrastructure. You have to be able to recognize the incoming webhook that says this request has been accepted or this request has been denied, and then send that back on into the front end. Uh, so it's a bit more work. But I just think that the user experience uh, in security uh, is, is so important, and, and I'd like to see more of this in the world. So kind of in summary, uh, users are pretty bad with passwords. I'm bad with my password. I've told you all that now today. And I worry that the more times I give this talk, the more people are going to go, well, I'll go find one of Phil's passwords. <laughs> and please don't. I'm looking at you people on the internet. Um, <laughs> the users are bad with passwords. But other websites are bad with passwords too, right? Um, you know, Ashley Madison lost 11 million of them. Adobe lost my password, most importantly. Um, and uh, you know, other websites, you can't trust other websites as well. Two-factor authentication can go over this uh, push method, uh, which allows you to do things nicely, the token method, or SMS. And I like to think of these three as a kind of uh, progressive enhancement or graceful degradation uh, in the terms of, uh, of kind of front-end development. Uh, and that what would be best is to give the best possible experience, send that push notification, allow the user to just accept. Uh, or you know have a, a nice application where you know we don't have to we, we can't we can still log in if we're on underground or in another country and finally like fall back to the the basis level that we can do which is SMS so two factor authentication really is is for your users it's to keep them safe it's to keep them safe from themselves it's to keep them safe from other people it's to keep me safe uh, and it's to keep them safe from this guy <laughs> who, I don't know, it's not come up very clearly, but apparently, I, I don't know, I think he stole that from the URL bar, I, I guess. He's that good a, that good a hacker. <sighs> um, uh, so that is, uh, yeah, two-factor authentication. It's for the users. It's for that experience. Um, please consider putting it in, in, in place. I don't care how you do it. Uh, if you want to do it with Authy or with Twilio, then please talk to me about it afterwards. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> I have one little thing uh, just to say, which is uh, that uh, Twilio are running a conference in two weeks in San Francisco. And if you are the kind of person that uh, says that's a fantastic idea and jumps on a plane immediately to San Francisco uh, and would like to come, uh, 
please do. It's going to be great. It's uh, about communications. It's, it covers all sorts of things from security uh, all the way through to other um, things, uh, like the very basic kind of voice and messaging stuff that we do to all the new exciting ways that we can communicate and add communication to our applications as developers. And if you, uh, if you use the code PNASH20, you'll get 20% off tickets. Uh, and that is all I wanted to say for you. So do we have uh, any questions at all? Yes. OK, uh, so I was told earlier that I need to repeat the question in terms of the uh, camera and microphone. So the question is um, uh, about users' privacy and their data and uh, it not being in the EU. And that's a very good point. Um, I'm not a lawyer, uh, but um, so Twilio and uh, Authy, I believe, both uh, um, satisfied uh, Safe Harbor back when it counted. Of course, it doesn't anymore, which is a shame. However, uh, there is a, an existing uh, thing that did hang around, it takes a little bit more work, and is known as model clauses. And that allows uh, that companies to sign contracts between them to uh, trust each other with the data and things like that. So uh, if you are into, um, uh, into that kind of legal side of things, or you need to point somebody else at that, uh, check out the terms and conditions for the model clauses section. It's under an EU particular section as well. So um, we do have uh, things in place for that. Uh, it is true the data is not in Europe at the moment. Uh, any other questions? Yes, go for it. Ah, OK. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, so the question is whether there's an existing app that does the push notification style uh, version of the um, two-factor authentication. Uh, not that I know. Well, the Authy app does. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to build your own, I don't know of uh, anything that exists at the moment. Um, might be worth keeping an eye on Authy in the next couple of weeks uh, to see if anything uh, crops up, but I can't really tell you anything more than that. In terms of building it all yourself, I, I have no idea uh, about that. I don't believe so. Um, uh, what I can tell you is that the, the kind of channels between um, Authy, the app, and Authy, the web service, are... Um, are uh, end-to-end encrypted and secure as hell. And, and it's one of those things that, yeah, it's, it's, it's a difficult one to do. And I, yeah, I, I kind of hope there is a, an open source a variant of it out there. But so many people seem to just uh, depend on Authenticator that I'm not sure there's necessarily been the demand for it. And that's, that's kind of a shame, because I, I feel like there's so much. The Authenticator could be a lot better. Uh, Google Authenticator could be a lot better. They, they could, they could. I mean, that then requires them to make this available as a service as well, because, uh, of course, there has to be the web service, the push, the ability to take the, um, the acceptance as well. Uh, so uh, they could do it. I'm not sure that's necessarily, I, I don't know what their core kind of <laughs> thing they do these days is, but I'm not sure that's necessarily on their roadmap for that kind of thing. Um, but do um, check out with Authy and see if you, you're interested in, in, in more and putting it into your own app as well. Uh, any other questions at all? No? Cool. Well, thank you very much for joining me this afternoon. Enjoy the last couple of talks, and I'll see you for a beer in the sunshine later. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs>